Hi, and welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church. My name is Michael Cromwell, and I have the joy of serving as one of the associate pastors here at RUMC. Thanks for joining us for our on-demand version of the sermon, which will be delivered later today. If you'd like to watch our services live, you can do so via our live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15. Notice our different worship times and our different hours that we have now. You'll also be able to see the entire worship service on demand later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. We are so glad that you are with us today. We're thankful for your presence and we're thankful for your generosity and the different ways that you are helping to make RUMC a place of community and faith. Let's have a word of prayer before we hear our sermon. Gracious and loving God, we love you so much and we are grateful for this day and this day that we have to worship you. May the words that we are to hear, may they not only pierce our ears, but pierce our hearts as well, that we might be changed in different people because of what you have to say to us today. We thank you and we love you all in Christ's name we pray, amen. Now let's hear our sermon from today. Our scripture today comes from Luke's Gospel, chapter 9, verses 28 through 36. About eight days after Jesus said this, he took Peter, John, and James with him and went up onto a mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. Two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendor talking with Jesus. They spoke about his departure which he was about to bring to fulfillment at Jerusalem. Peter and his companions were very sleepy. But when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men standing with him. And as the men were leaving Jesus, Peter said to him, Master, it's good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what he was saying. And while he was speaking, a cloud appeared and covered them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. A voice came from the cloud saying, This is my son, whom I have chosen. Listen to him. And when the voice had spoken, they found that Jesus was alone. The disciples kept this to themselves and did not tell anyone at that time what they had seen. Let us pray. Gracious God, be with us here in this moment today. Open our ears to hear and our hearts to receive. And Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be yours and not my own. O oh Lord, my God, my rock, and my redeemer. Amen. This is a mountaintop story, and we like life on the mountaintops. The times and places in our lives when we feel closest to Jesus, where we feel that Jesus is near us. These are the times when we know that we are loved and that we are forgiven and that we are redeemed. They remind us that we are children of God. And it's an incredible feeling. We would be happy to stay in this space forever. And I think that's why the mountaintop in this story so captures our imagination. There is a tremendous mystery at the heart of the story. There's awe and surprise. Jesus is transformed and appears in dazzling light. And then he's suddenly accompanied by two of Israel's greats, Moses and Elijah. And soon after, God speaks from the cloud and proclaims that this is his son, in Jesus' inner circle, Peter, James, and John, they have front row seats to it all. They are eyewitnesses despite their struggle to fully understand what's happening. And we, the onlookers who centuries later, we're also invited to encounter the wonder of God through Jesus in this passage. But in truth, the wonder of God in Jesus is not only revealed on the mountaintop. Yes, that is where Jesus' divine nature is made clear. But this nature, the fact that Jesus is God incarnate, is also revealed in his teachings and in his actions. 
What comes before and after helps us see the whole story. And it's only when we consider the wonder of it all that we fully see who Jesus is, the Son of God who calls and strengthens and leads us into the world. But since this passage focuses on the mountaintop, that is where we're going to start. Now, there are many stories in Scripture that speak of mountains as holy places where people encounter God. As a matter of fact, you might recall that both Moses and Elijah play central roles in two of these stories. Moses went up to the mountaintop to meet with God, and there he saw God from the backside. And when he came down, the people said his face shone like the sun. And Elijah, thinking that all was lost, he ran into the wilderness, finally came to the mountain of God, went up on the mountain, went into a cave, and then heard the voice of God speaking to him, assuring him and sending him back to the people. And these mountain stories, these three included, they almost always talk about what happens at the summit. They barely give a nod to the ascent and hardly say a word about the descent. And if you've ever hiked, well, it's not hard to imagine why this might be so. It is that experience at the summit that we all love. That's what we like to tell about. The moment when you can stand on the edge of the mountain and you look out over the valley, it's almost impossible to put into words that feeling because it is so filled with awe and wonder. It's beautiful, and it can have a profound effect on us. I remember when I was in high school, I spent part of a summer in Colorado and was able to hike in the Sangre de Cristo Mountains, which are part of the Rocky Mountain chain. This mountain range has peaks that range anywhere from 12,000 to 14,000 feet, and the views from these mountains are stunning. They stay with you long after you have ever been there. Even today, I can remember standing on the ledge of one of these mountains and looking out over into the valley and seeing this high mountain lake there while it was snowing in July. It's a moment that has stayed with me for 32 years. Yet people when they ask me about it even then and even today, find that I have a hard time putting into words exactly the feeling I felt standing there that day. And I think that's how Peter, James, and John probably felt too on the mountain. It's not surprising that Peter wanted to stay there in that place on the mountain because reaching that higher ground, catching your breath, And fully seeing the beauty of it all, it makes you want to stay. But the disciples, once their minds cleared, they saw the fullness of God in Jesus. And it was profound. It was a mountaintop experience and they were amazed. They saw Jesus appear in all of God's glory. And they heard God speak. But then they kept it to themselves, it says, at that time. And why do you think that is? I think it's probably because they fully didn't understand what had happened. They needed time to process it, to put it into all into context. And I think it's only later that they can tell about it after they've seen and experienced more. We hear Peter write in 1 Peter that we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. And John reflects in one of his letters that we will know Jesus when he appears because we will see him just as he is. They knew. They knew in part on that day in the mountains that they had encountered the holy. But it was only later that they fully understood And we know what that is like. Because when we have a mountaintop experience, there is always a story that comes before it and one that comes after it. The mountaintop experience often changes the way that we view the preceding events and it leads us into new understandings. 
So, like us, the disciples had to consider that mountaintop experience in context of their full experience. The transfiguration of Jesus offered a glimpse of what is possible, not only for Jesus, but for all of humanity. And this glimpse helped complete the story. The encounter at the summit only happens because we're willing to make the climb. The encounter with Jesus happens because we are willing to follow. If you look back in the scripture that we read today to the verses just before, you'll see that eight days before going up the mountain that Jesus tells the disciples that he is going to die. And then he says, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. Following Jesus, it isn't always easy. And in fact, if we think about the mountaintop experience as a metaphor for encountering Jesus, we can think about the climb as a metaphor for our approach to him. Looking back on my experiences of hiking, I realized that when I would come to the entry of a trail, anytime I do that, it doesn't tell me very much about what the trail is going to be like. Really, the entry point usually looks pretty easy. It might even have a nice little arch like this one. You don't see a lot of incline. It doesn't look like it's going to be difficult. You can't see what's coming. It's not until you get on the trail and you realize that there are really big inclines. And sometimes you'll look up the trail and you'll think that you see a crest, but when you reach it, you realize that it was only a turn in the trail or a way that the slope changed so that you couldn't see the rest of the trail. And then there is this unstable ground that will sometimes cause you to slip and make the climb tricky. And soon your pack will feel heavy and you begin to wonder, will you ever reach the summit? Following Jesus is much like this. Early on in the journey of faith, it seems relatively easy, but it doesn't take long for the twists and turns of life to become more complex and challenging. And soon it can feel like one of the hardest trips that we have ever taken. Because following Jesus is often defined more by the climb than it is by the summit. There are times when it may feel like we won't survive, when we want to give up. Just think about Elijah. And I suspect if the disciples had fully understood what Jesus was saying eight days before, they might have had a harder time making the decision to follow him up the mountain, much less to the cross. Yet it is this journey with its glimpses of grace and glory that ultimately fills them with gratitude and strengthens them. The journey to the top is worth it. And the disciples see what others only saw later. They wanted to stay there, but they also learned that we are not meant to stay in the rarefied air of the mountaintop. Our personal experiences with God are not always meant to be kept private. Jesus has changed there on the mountain in in the way that he is seen. And when he's changed, he acts in and for the world accordingly. Seeing Jesus differently means seeing ourselves differently. It means living lives that are changed through our encounter. We can't encounter the kingdom of God. We can't see the divine and not be changed by it. The transfiguration takes place on the mountain But the next day, it comes down to the streets where people live and need transfiguration. Listen to the rest of the story. The next day, when they came down from the mountain, a large crowd met them. A man in the crowd called out, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son, for he is my only child. A spirit seizes him, and he suddenly screams. It throws him into convulsions so that he foams at the mouth. It scarcely leaves him and is destroying him. I begged your disciples to drive it out, but they could not. You unbelieving and perverse generation, Jesus replied, 
how long shall I stay with you and put up with you? Bring your son here. And even while the boy was coming, the demon threw him to the ground in a convulsion. But Jesus rebuked the impure spirit, healed the boy, and gave him back to his father. When Jesus came down the mountain with Peter, James, and John, they are met by this father, this father who has a son, his only child, who is clinging to life. And we see Jesus heal him and return him to his father. And that day, that father and that son, they met the kingdom of God. They found transfiguration. I read this story and I think about the numerous ways that we put our faith into action here at RUMC. The Giving Garden is one of those ways that we do it. It's a place where people encounter Jesus at work through the people that are growing and caring for the crops there. A few years ago, if you had gone down and looked at that plot of ground, you might have thought that nothing would grow there. There was some evidence maybe that something had once grown there, but it looked like it had been a while. But then a member of our congregation, she had a vision and she had this encounter with God and she said, I want to plant a garden there again. And so she began to gather people to tell them about her plan, about what she felt God was calling her to do. And together they planted this garden. The garden that now provides hundreds and hundreds of pounds of produce, fresh produce, to families who could not otherwise afford it. And the garden, while it doesn't entirely solve the problem of food insecurity in our community, it does provide hope. And through it, people are discovering transfiguration in connection with others. They are encountering the kingdom of God. Professing our faith is one thing, but living our faith requires greater depth and breadth. The path to encountering Jesus is not always easy. And when we do encounter him, our journeys don't end. On the mountaintop, we encounter Jesus, but in the public square, we follow Jesus. We live our lives so that others see Jesus. Our behavior changes. We become one with Jesus and his mission to the world. The power of the story of transfiguration is that it comes down the mountain. The, vision, the story is a vision that carries, uh, carries us down to ground level and gives us a glimpse of unimagined possibility. Soon it will be Lent. Next week we'll observe Ash Wednesday and it will begin that 40-day journey of looking at our own lives and discovering what we need to let go of or take on in order to prepare our hearts for Easter, for resurrection for new life. But today it's good for us to be in this place to worship. It is good for us to hear this mountaintop story and spend time with it, to know and believe that God came to us in the person of Jesus. But we can't stop here. We can't sit in this moment with awe and wonder and not do anything else. We can reflect on the path that has led us here, but we have to also imagine where God is leading us. And we have to decide if we are willing to take the journey. We have to decide if we are willing to follow. Jesus shows us through his life and his words to consider all the wonder. And these glimpses, they help us know that we are never alone on the path. We're never alone even in the most difficult moments. And we are strengthened by Jesus for the journey. Or as in the words of Fred Craddock, without the journey, the world will never be healed. And Jesus calls us to be his hands and feet that will help to heal the world. In the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit.
Amen. Thanks again for joining us today. Um, just a reminder, if you'd like to watch the entire worship service, you can do so via live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15 a.m. You can also view the service on demand a little bit later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. Also, if you have any prayer requests, we would love to hear about those. You can send those in to pray at rumc.com. Also, if you'd like to give of your tithes and your offerings, you can do that online as well. And that's at rumc.com slash giving. Uh, thanks again for joining us today and for honoring God with your presence. We hope and pray that you have a wonderful week and we look forward to seeing you again next week. Hi. Thank you for joining us. My name is Tom Davis. I'm senior pastor here at Roswell United Methodist Church. Our mission here at RUMC is to help people live a Christ-centered life. We're a welcoming church, we're a biblical church, and we're a compassionate church. That the, we believe that the way that, that God made us, that He made us in His image. And what the Bible tells us is that His image is an us, is an our. When God said in the creation story, let us create humans in our image, He made us to be in community together. He made us to connect to Him and one another. That's the place that this is at Roswell United Methodist Church, a place of community and faith. I want to invite you to join us. It might be online, it might be through social media, or it might be here in person. We meet at 9 o'clock in a contemporary service with a band. We also have two 1115 services. One is here in the sanctuary with a traditional choir and organ. We also meet at 1115 with a band in our chapel. Thank you for joining us, and I look forward to meeting you.